What should I put? Uh, this is the uh, Build OGM call for Tuesday, December 7th, 2021. Sorry, Mark. And I was just talking about uh, an upcoming call with Daryl Davis for Weaving the World. Go ahead, Mark. Um, my question was going to be, what do we call this call? <laughs> it's ah. still Build, build OGM, uh, yeah. but tomorrow is no longer Generative Commons. It's Weaving the World. Tomorrow, Tomorrow's morning's call uh, uh, is now the Weaving the World operations call. Exactly. Yes, okay. Yep. And so, and so there we're going to talk details. Pete and Stacy and I have been in conversation about, uh, he is writing some automation so that, um, <clears throat> so that the steps from, Hey, we just finished a zoom call to look at this pretty page for the episode. And it's got a transcript and it's got a record, you know, pointers to recordings and all that. So that that actually happens as automatically as possible. And it, at this point, it's going to still take a whole lot of manual interruptions uh you know to carry stuff from one task to the other but <clears throat> but 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 we're trying to synchronize up so that his automation meshes with my work meshes with possibly hiring somebody to do some video editing or or, or some audio editing or something like that because we don't we don't know how much work is in each stage yet uh, hi hank hi 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 and uh, happy pearl harbor day if that's the appropriate uh, term to everyone i don't know that happy is used a lot but yes indeed <laughs> Um, so Jerry, go ahead, Stacey. Can you hear me well? Yes. You're a little, okay. you're, you're, it's a little bit broken up, but we hear you just fine. Okay. So after looking at the one page, Weaving the World and being reminded of what's happening under the surface, I was thinking that what about if we invited people to contribute? Um, when I'm talking about specifically people that do mapping, if we mm -hmm. invited them to use whatever tool they're comfortable with, to map the call in real time, though, like to be there for the call and be taking notes and doing what they're doing as a way to include more people and then just see how that, even if it's just a one-time thing, have people doing it the different ways. And then at the end, when we put the call up, we can put the different graphic interpretations up. So um, can easily do that. And that's completely the intention for the composting calls, for the second calls. Um, we were, I was trying to make this first recording like as simple as possible, therefore not include other people and kind of make it just Daryl and me, but it's very tempting to do exactly what you said. But, but what you said is precisely in the invitation for the composting call. It's like, hey, there's this great conversation with a guy named Daryl Davis, anybody, anybody with any mapping tools who'd like to come and map this, uh, please, you know, join now and we're going to do this together uh, live and after and then contribute to this and then all of those artifacts will also be on the on the episode page, which is one of the things that I hope distinguishes a Weaving the World episode from from other normal things. Does that make sense? Uh, the Stacey, other thing that I oh, yes, Stacey. it does. But I just want to I just want to add. I think we had discussed this in another call. The idea of having a few people at least be able to show up adds to that personal connection because now you have, you know, let's say there's six people that show up they're actually meeting the guest, which is very different than just watching. And also they don't have to go watch an episode afterward on their own time. They actually were in the conversation. I, that makes total sense to me. Uh, so what I could do is say, hey, if I could put out a call to all OGM mappers, anybody who would like to map this conversation, please, you know, RSVP uh, yes. and I can ring them back. That would work. Mark, any strong feelings either way? Um, something slightly connected, um, strong feelings um, aside. Um, also kind of a call for a little bit of assistance. Um, I am having the uh, time of your life idea map memex intelligence augmentation meetup um, at the Internet Archive on Saturday the 18th mm. between two and five. Um, the forte of building a second brain is going to be there and basically thinks that he's going to have about 100 people show up. Oh, wow. For his kind of thing. Which I'm in, a, kind in, a, of, in a virtual thing, right? This is not face-to-face -face at the uh, face archive? To face. It face -to -face. is face-to-face. -face. Holy crap. Face -to -face. Yes. Um, last um, Saturday was the um, Foresight Vision Weekend 2021. Um, and there were 300 people there. And they had um, swabs that you put up your nose and, and you know put in the little um, five minute test. Who knows how good it is, but better than nothing. Um, and that was kind of an interesting um, mass 
uh, behavior, which, uh, of course, none of us have ever seen before. Um, but um, certainly um, the people here in San Francisco, like Bob Horn and um, I keep on, I have a block remembering her name. Eileen Clegg? No, no, no. Um, Just guessing. <laughs> Sounds uh, like I'll, I'll come up. I'll come up with it with it later. Um, Sophie something. Sophie's um, choice. No, um, I'd buy her Sophie. Uh, type in. Um, that's okay. Oh, she's probably in your in your MX. Um, I'm looking. <laughs> oh, okay. <clears throat> but it's not. It's it's not Sophia. It's not Sophie. It's some other name. But um, uh, one of the people who's doing the large mapping project. Um based here in San Francisco, and I can't remember it, but- sure, um, I wanna know, but um, um, it'll come to you. You do know her, yes. Um, uh, but um, basically, if there's a lot of people kind of breaking it up into those three areas, augmentation, mapping, memex, um, but I'm hoping to um, introduce OGM at the least, and then perhaps uh, um, a, I'm not sure exactly how to break things up, but you know, 10 minutes for introduction, five minutes for questions might be too short. Um, could be 10 and 10, you know, 20 minutes for, for people, but um, uh, uh, certainly having a Zoom guest, um, Jerry, if you're interested. Um, yeah, that could work well. Um, um, and the question would be, you know, trying to find out people who are doing mapping of their own, of their encounters with media in Rome or Obsidian or, or um, IdeaPath or whatever to yep. basically contribute. Cool. So that's on the 18th uh, in the afternoon. Yes. San Francisco time face to face. That sounds very cool. And, and I, I, do you know or remember that I'm the guest? today this friday's uh archive lunch i was not told oh okay so i'm i'm you know uh, I'll, I'll be doing what margaret did uh last week was it last week or week before i think it was a week before yeah i think it was a week before too yeah um so i'm i'll do 20 minutes worth of brain and ogm uh just to sort of talk about it because i'm just i'm just really interested in how what ogm is trying to get done layers into <clears throat> the kinds of work you were talking about um that the archive would like to do so so if you want to think about that as well, I think it would be it would be nice to, to coordinate a little bit so that um, you can offer some some depth into, you know, what what you've smelled over here. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to. Cool, cool, cool. So sorry um, to, you were talking about um, Daryl Davis. Yes. And you're going to go on to the next one. Yeah. Stacy and I. You know, and and also Stacy said was encouraging us to invite more people to the actual call on Thursday, <clears throat> which and if Daryl replies quickly, I can easily put an, an uh, you know an all points bulletin out on OPB on on on, o, on OGM sorry, <clears throat> Oregon Public Broadcasting OPB interesting, um, uh, and do that. So um, and also I think it depends a little bit on what Daryl's comfortable with, but I'm sure he's comfortable with most anything given how brave I think he is for the work he's done. <clears throat> yeah, although, although it's really interesting, um, a girlfriend long ago uh, worked with authors and wound up working a little bit with Maya Angelou, who it turns out was a, like a really kind of hard customer to work with and micromanaged everything about her appearances. And my take after the fact, like in retrospect, is that she was just managing because so many things had gone wrong over time because she's Maya Angelou and a huge character that, that she made sure every little detail went the way she knew it needed to go. And that was just the work she had to put in to not be taken advantage of, to not have things get hijacked to not whatever, I don't know. But, but she was just like you know, thor a thorny client to, to, to have come in and do stuff. I have uh, listened to a writer. And also a writer, yeah. A recent podcast. Um... Let's see who it was. Um, Shermer. And uh, I can't find it in the history. But um, basically, 
somebody named Shermer who does skeptics something hmm. um, interviewing uh, somebody who does uh, psychological studies and basically saying that um, any competent journalist can make somebody look like a hero or a villain. Yeah, that's, that's totally true. And um, that struck me as Michael, Michael Shermer. Michael Shermer, thank you. That yeah. struck me as fantastically interesting where it comes to questions of choice and aesthetics. Yeah. Um, well, I, so my undergraduate is in econometrics, which I refer to as how to lie with numbers, because with a little bit of econometrics training, I realized you give me a data set and then you give me what story you want to tell. And I can eliminate outliers, change the axis, do whatever to probably tell your story. Right. So, so that gave me a really nice skeptical lens for when I see written, you know, articles that refer to numbers. I'm like, oh, let's just pause for a second, see what they've done here. Mm-hmm. Um, and if the axis doesn't go down to zero, I'm like, mm, mm, mm. Uh, really, you know, some really brutally simple sort of stuff. <clears throat> How to lie with statistics. Exactly. L- lies, damned lies, and statistics. That's the title of a book. <clears throat> um, Hank, do you have any strong feelings about? Weaving the World uh, early episodes uh, being just me and the interviewee or inviting more more people into it? Uh, Yeah, actually, since you developed the idea uh, in this way, uh, with then a composting session with a lot of different people, I would like to see if this works. You know, you and the person that you're speaking with in a in a dialogue, in a conversation. And uh, if you do it twice, okay, it might work one time, might not work another time. Try the third time uh, incorporating what you've learned. And if that's not satisfactory, use uh, another idea, for example, uh, Stacy's idea. So you're saying keep the first interview just to the two people. That's what I'm saying because that's your conception of it. You sold well, it. It was. To me. It was. A, it was, a, that, it was good. that was just a pragmatic step to do the simplest thing that could possibly work. That was where I was aiming. It's like let's keep this as simple. Let's let's do as few moving parts and as little embellishment as possible, so that we get yeah. the whole thing sort of from start to finish done. I like. I as you know, I love group calls and I'm, I have no trouble sort of yeah. facilitating and keeping people at bay and whatever else. Um, Stacy, go ahead. I was going to say the other people invited don't have to be speakers. They could just be present. You know, yeah. they have five sure. minutes before. You know, they're there five minutes before the call, or maybe after the call. There's like five minutes where the recording stops, and they just make you know make their greetings and. Or I can also I can also give them space toward the end of the call to so, ask questions. Right. I yeah. just think it's so important since we're talking about collaborate you know we're talking about mycelium and all this yeah, that yeah. at every turn we want to that there be more fungal varieties opportunities present. for new connections yeah i like i like that a lot cc makes it makes a ton of sense to me um, um may, may i make another another yes, uh, uh, another thought building on what i said before uh i, th- I think i think what stacy's saying is good uh, i agree with you uh the other thing is i listen to lots of podcasts, see lots of video, YouTube uh, interviews, and a one-on-one that really works can be a very powerful thing. So uh, while agreeing with Stacy, I'd like to see if you can, uh, can create that, uh, that special power that, you know, two people finding themselves and engaging like that. Well, I mean, it's just, just a thought. Um, I like that a lot. And, and also in my life, and in particular in Zoom life the last couple of years, I find I've had a lot of conversations where it's just the first meeting between me and someone. And at the end of the conversation, I'm like, God damn it, I wish I'd recorded that. Yeah, Be- because it went beautifully, and there was this really like lovely thing created between us. And yeah. it's the little aha moment that I refer to. Uh, sometimes it's like, you know, there was, we, we made something that neither of us knew before from sharing knowledge and all that, that, that little thing is what, what I'm trying to bottle. Yeah. And the moment you turn it into a show and start to record it and all that, it changes the setting of it. So yeah. then 
then you have to recreate that moment somehow and ignore the cameras and sort of get there, which makes intimacy of, of like just two people a little bit better. But as, as Stacy's pointing out, like the mycelial aspects of this are really, really interesting and important. And the community side of it, that I'm just one, I'm just one, one weaver using one particular weird tool. Um, and what's interesting here is the confluence of our of multiple weavers acting on this in, you know, together. I think that's really important. Um, cool. Uh, and let me describe the second, uh, the second call that's, that's uh, we're booking right now, which is with Jesse Engel. Um, so Jesse runs a good works house out of Santa Monica, uh, where just before pandemic, they kind of had a co-housing kind of arrangement with people with good intentions to try to solve the world. And, and it was kind of because uh, Santa Monica and Venice Beach and all that have a strong arts community. Uh, and there's a little bit of Hollywood, a little bit of techie and a little bit of woo woo kind of nearby. Uh, they kind of had uh, a, a nice mix of, of people kind of coming through and then pandemic hits. So it's like, oh my God, we're running, a, we're running a collective living space. What do we do? Uh, so for a while, they sort of shut things down. Then they started doing some virtual things well. And then they got into NFTs and, and the, the whole uh, crypto world a bit. Uh, and and they're doing now um, they're they're creating a good works DAO where a piece of the money uh, they're they're sort of floating uh, some some tokens to fund artists in Haiti in part and so so there's a whole really interesting way in which they're trying to harness this new movement and they're close to communities that are doing a lot of work in there and care a lot about it. Uh, but harness it for good because just like way too much NFT stuff is like just crazy and seems useless to me. <clears throat> um, and so, so that's the second one that we're framing up and that's happening quickly because on the 15th, they're kind of launching this idea of the good work style. Uh, and we would like to do an interview and put it in the world as promotional material for them. And as an episode of weaving the world for us. <clears throat> so that's the, the second one. And I'm, I'm, I'm on Discord. I've, I've, re, I've reopened a Discord client. Uh, oh, good. Eh. So, um, so Jesse just sent a note back saying 4 p.m. today. Cool. Uh, Mark, you're muted. Thank you. Is this Jesse Engel, the one I'm finding uh, in Google research as well, senior research scientist? No, that's a different Jesse Engel. Okay. I don't believe he's ever had it posted to at Google. <clears throat> um, 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 J E S S E E N G E L? And uh, G L E. G L E. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Sorry, Barry, Susie? I'm sure I don't need to remind you, but I just want you to. Keep in mind your constrictions with today. I know. Well, I'm Are hoping... you going to have a spot? <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm expecting to get a new machine delivered, hopefully by 1 p.m. And FedEx has been totally disappointing me. Like the app has been worthless. Uh, so if it doesn't arrive by then, then I kind of have a problem, a, log a logistics problem. But I think, I think if I force the issue by booking this, then it's just going to cause <laughs> the machine to show up, right? Right. You can always that. put a note on the door to the FedEx guy. There, there is a note on the, the door. door. There's a note on the door at this very moment. It's like knock loud. Okay. We're both on calls. Um, but thank you. Agreed. Um, cool. So any thoughts on, on those things? Um, certainly here in the Bay Area, there are a number of co-housing groups. Um, uh, the most interesting that I've encountered um, of many uh, is the Embassy Network. And again, COVID just. Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer, before. Oh, there goes Michael. There goes Michael. Yeah. Um, <laughs> same thing happened on this side. It's like I'm looking for the video and back, ah, I start stalking. Anyway. <laughs> um, okay. uh, I will post the uh, Embassy Network's um, uh, sort of URL, but they've kind of started these intentional groups, which are uh, incredibly interesting. Um, the most interesting to me is kind of like the second chance house for people coming out of uh, San Quentin. Mm -hmm and um, a number of different uh, 
uh, experiments in community that happened at the Red Vic. Unfortunately, bad things happened, and uh, including COVID, and, and they kind of had to shut that down. But um, uh, Zarina, uh, what's Zarina's last name? Agnew, I believe. Um, uh, just put on so many incredibly interesting scientists and you know, was trying to do the type of weaving the world um, uh, in person and community, mm -hmm. um, you know, without, you know, the backup of, of mapping, but, but basically highfalutin uh, critical theory plus neurology plus, um, uh, you know, I got uh, uh, Terry Deacon to give a talk at one of the science talks. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll spell it out because it's difficult. Um, but uh, <clears throat> they, um, she and her partner who is now at Oxford studying philosophy um, really you know, were poking in some very interesting areas, especially when it came to kind of intentional hedonism. I mean, it was, it was far out wacky, funny, um, uh, learned and, um, uh, you know, to give back to them, I would, I would love to uh, see them uh, at least have a chance to participate in something that's more um, online. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, are you recommending I approach them and we do something together? Are you saying, because I'm, I'm really interested in reaching out to other people who are busy doing mapping also and having them be other other forces in this stream, basically, you know, adding to the mapping into the layers and building out in whatever way they are good at and they, you know, they love to do. So I'm, 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 this, this is hopefully the beginning of a bunch of different kinds of collaborations and eddies of, uh, of information as we, as we feed the fungus. That's certainly the idea. I mean, uh, you know, when you were talking about one-on-one -on -one interviews, it reminded me of my campfires and basically getting two people together. Um, and, uh, and that threeness seemed to be an incredible, um, an incredible sense of participation, which doesn't quite come across in a video. You kind of have to be there interacting in person, um, getting all the uh, paralinguistic cues, how they dress, their posture, um, you know, their smiling, um, uh, things that you don't get in, uh, in even a Zoom call, say. Um, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, but uh, I will uh, um, approach them. And um, yeah, I mean, connecting people together is, is mm -hmm. part of what all of this is about and figuring out how connecting can have side effects that create a residue that's valuable for other folk. Cool. And I'll, I'll mute and I'm replying to Jesse Engel real quick, just so that he gets word for me. Um, cool. And thanks. Uh, thanks for the embassy link. Um, so a piece of what's happening with Pete is that we are figuring out a workflow and he's done a sort of a schematic of, of some of the workflow and uh, we're figuring out where the moving parts are and all that. It's, it's, it's for a simple project, it's relatively complicated. Um, so, so again, we're trying to figure out how many things. Oh, Zarina, Zarina, wow. Um, cool, thank you. You're muted again. Just agreeing that it is a complicated name. Yeah, cool name. Yeah, it is. And a very cool woman. Um, there's no picture here, but, um, uh, you know, color. Pete, I, Pete, I was just invoking your demon. And so look, 
There you go. Bing! Just like that. Um, I was just mentioning that uh, we're working through the logistics of the workflow for the episodes of Weaving the World and what that looks like, <clears throat> and then meshing, meshing together human effort and automation as much as we can and uh, seeing where, what, you know, where that goes. Uh, and I think you just saw on Discord that uh, Jesse and I will be on at 4 p.m. today. Yep. Cool. Um, um, can you, um, for those of us who've never used Discord and have attempted to avoid it. Oh. <laughs> it's remarkably like Mattermost in Slack. Mm -hmm. except, okay. it, except it includes voice chat and other sorts of things that I haven't really used much. Mm. Right, is that right, Pete? Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it suggested to listen in? I can easily not. That's uh... well. It's it's much less like Clubhouse than it uh, sounds. I think he's asking about like the it. meeting with Jesse. Oh, the yes. meeting with Jesse. Um, oh, I, I didn't I'm happy pick that not. Up. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think Jesse would be fine. I, yeah, we haven't been doing. I we we kind of shied away from fishbowl calls. I think. Okay, so probably this one is a. Uh, is a small group recording. Yep. Um, cool. And I, and Pete, we also talked about Daryl Davis, and I'm coordinating with him to see if Thursday still works. If not, you know, uh, pick a pick a better date next week or whatever. Uh, and then we talked a bit through. Okay, what what would make uh, a call with Daryl Davis you know, under the under the auspices of weaving the world different from your average interesting podcast interview? Um, so we went into some of the weaving stuff and Stacy recommended, uh, very nicely and just sort of hung on it for a while, uh, just inviting other mappers into the call right up front and not making it just me and, and Daryl, but making it sort of me, Daryl and, and a few mappers, uh, and putting out an, uh, an all points bulletin to OGM and say, Hey, Hey mappers, if you'd like to take a swing at this, here's a way to do it. And also say that we're going to do the composting call after yep. where we get another swing at this. Um, Cool, and that that we sort of cleared all that business right when you uh, right when you stepped in. Do you have any things you want to talk about here uh, about the process and the workflow and stuff like that? Since this um, is Build OGM. Uh, real real quick uh, question. I I'm not expecting to be on with you and Jesse either. Okay. Um, unless you want me there, but um, I think it'd be totally great if you wanted to be there. Um, but I'm, yeah. I think Jesse and I. Are, I feel like it'll be a better call. If, if we're old. Weird. We're old friends. I think it'll work fine uh, as it is. Yeah. Um, otherwise, um, I so, it, so I, I guess a, a thing that I'm hoping out of. I think I'm hoping for OGM uh, as as it bumps a little bit into um, Good Workhouse is to learn a little bit from them um, how to be a little bit more connected to the world, um, um, a little bit more art and culture um, uh, connected to OGM, and a little bit more um, uh, more of the ability to reach out to a bunch of people and say, let's crowdfund this, you know, this good work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Good Workhouse is in a, in a in a place where they can do that, they've got a, a few more people, or, or they've got more connectivity to, um, you know, their their circles reach out a couple layers um, and and get bigger than OGM circles. So I wish that I wish OGM were like that more. We don't have or do a lot of arts things, like sort of period. I think we have people who are interested in arts, but we don't go into those conversations much. Um, we don't do a lot of work there. It, the other, you know, they have the advantage that they they have um, a, a, a huge IRL component. Um, right. So it's it's easier to nudge art into that kind of thing. You know, it's like, oh look, we're doing the meetup, and we decorated the walls. You know, there's there's people who put up art on the walls. We're doing a meetup, and by the way, we invited some live music this time, you know, that kind of stuff. So we, it's, it's a little bit harder for us to kind of do it organically, I think, but um, I also think it's an important thing that we, we, OGM is a little bit <laughs> like a walking brain instead of, you know, um, uh, the whole human that, that sings and dances and plays. Yeah. As well. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, and there are other events I attend sometimes that start with a guitarist playing a song or you know other other sorts of things. And we're not taking advantage of of that part of our of our beings um, much at all. We have a little bit of time, but um, since the pandemic, um, Brewster started um, every uh, meeting at the Internet Archive with a musician or poet um, and giving them a stipend of about a hundred bucks um, for 10 minutes of, of play. And the range has been absolutely incredible. Um, there, uh, uh, last Friday was a, uh, a Persian musician, I believe, uh, playing the oud or something like that. It was just ah, incredible. That's lovely. Also, a very simple thing uh, for Rex, which I started in 2010. Every Rex meeting, I would start with a poem, and that caused me to read a tremendous amount more poetry and find a whole bunch of delicious poems. And <clears throat> I, I would never pick up. I, I would. I don't think I ever read just excerpts of long poems, of epic poems or longer poems. But but I you know so the size was a bit of a constraint, but it was just a, a delicious thing. And one time we had a guest with us who was really good at reading poetry. And he said, uh -uh, mind if I do this? And he stepped in and gave, <laughs> and gave like a great reading. I'm like, oh man, that was awesome. So even, even just a little bit of poetry sets a, 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 a I, I'm reminded of um, some online space. I'm forgetting which one anymore. Uh, years ago in the days when you dialed up and your, your log basically scrolled past you. And it was an online space where when you entered, there was a banner that went across the page that said, please take a moment and center yourself before entering here. And that's all it did. It didn't, it didn't lock up your keyboard. It didn't, you know, there was, there was no built-in pause or anything. It just asked you to center yourself, but it created like a little, uh, like a little liminal threshold where as you entered the space, it was a little bit more special and you'd be a little, a little bit more mindful. Uh, so sometimes really tiny markers do a lot of work and work really well. Uh, Stacy. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, I agree, like, you know, the poetry and how it sets the mood and the music, but I just want to add that when you're actually with musicians or artists, there's something about the real world connections, you will have the most diverse group that you could imagine. You know, I mean, I go, I know bands that some of them are lawyers, some of them are like unemployed scraping by, but they're all working together. And that's a function of being creators in that sense. So just, you know, that's the, that's like when, like Pete, they do, they do have an advantage other than, you know, the real world, just in general, just the type of people that wind up being connected to each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Pete and I originally met through a common friend, David Eisenberg, who held a, an annual event for telecom geeks and always invited artists uh, to be artists in residence in resident during the entire event. And some of them were, I mean, a lot, all of them were excellent because his other passion besides being a geek, a telecom geek is, is music. And he hosts people through his home in Woods Hole constantly uh, and has been a lifeline, I think for a lot of artists during lockdown uh, doing kind of the same thing in Zooms and a little bit at face-to-face -face as things got a little bit better. Um, but, but some of those artists were fantastic. And one of them was really good with harmonicas and disassembled his harmonicas for us and basically showed us how everything works and all the, you know, all the little, how you tune them, what you do to make your harmonica make notes it's not supposed to make, uh, all that kind of stuff. He was just brilliant. And he was, he was pretty geeky in, in, in sort of that sense as well. So, so you get to know these people pretty well. Um, so since I'm gonna just put out my, my wish for the future. One day I wanna see an OGM band. And I want to hear Pete Ooh. playing in it because I, I know that's a passion you have, you know, like a softball team, except instead of band that I'm like putting that. it out to the universe. I like that. Uh, and you're reminding me uh, in Argentina, there was an obscure band called Les Luthiers. They have a Wikipedia page. Here we go. Um, uh, <clears throat> so, um, uh, and, and I visited my dad in Argentina in 1979 for half a summer, I think. And he got us tickets and we went to see Le Dussier. And these guys basically started as music students in a, uh, at an Argentine university. And they began doing home-built instruments. So they invented the tubófono acrílico cromático, 
basically the the acrylic tube that that is is a chromatic instrument and and they they made a whole bunch of homebrew instruments then they invented the character johann sebastian mastropiero uh which i who i put here who is you know obviously meant to be in the line of johann sebastian bach but then they created stories and they had this narrator with a booming voice and they created these hilarious stories about the adventures of mastropiero who was basically an ignoramus with no talent uh, and then they would break into songs of different kinds, and some of which I have here. I'll, I'll, I'll share this link uh, in our chat in a sec. But they were just brilliant and really fun. And this is, they were there in a time when bad shit was going down in Argentina. So I think they provided um, some relief in some sense. Um, but there was, there, there was one where they, they described uh, a march, a, uh, basically like a military procession at, at, on some festival day, and they describe the ranks of everything else. And then in the middle of the march, surrounded by guards, are the, the last Mapuches, basically still alive, who are the, the native inhabitants of, of Patagonia, <clears throat> right? And, and, and so there's, there's like every piece of the army surrounding this, this poor band of Mapuches uh, in the middle. So, so they, were, they were political and ironic, but I think they had limits for what they could do back in the day. All right. Um, what other Bildo Jammy things are sort of in our heads right now? Because if we don't have any other any other moving parts to do, maybe we fold our call. Um, kind of probably a little bit off topic, but maybe not entirely. Um, I ran into my first uh, serious air table problem uh, last night. <laughs> Um, uh, I've, I've got a client that I'm doing some uh, Airtable work for, and uh, part of that Airtable work, uh, I've got uh, a script that creates a, a, a fancy set of tables. Um, and last night it just broke. Um, uh, you know, it's been working fine for months and uh, it just catches errors. And so creating a table or creating fields and tables um, throws an error. Um, really frustrating. Uh, uh, this was late last night, so I sent an email and got an auto response that says, we'll back, be back at you in an hour, and um, it, it actually took a little bit longer than an hour, but some nice person, Aaron, um, wrote back this morning and said, wow, I've repeated, you know, I've, I've replicated it on my machine, and I've uh, sent it over to engineering, and by the way, did you think of this workaround, which I hadn't, um, um, and so it's clumsy and clunky and stuff and took some some engineering to get the the workaround installed but the workaround is working more or less so now, i assume they've got a pretty good community online of people solving problems yeah or? it was um yeah they've got it it's a it's actually running a, a discourse <laughs> Which I was going to ask. Yeah, it's probably on uh, discourse is, or discourse. Which is, uh, discourse. Um, oh, okay. It's it's fun when you know discourse and the, and the interface because if you don't, it's a little clunky. But but once you do, then it's like, oh, I you know I know why you know this or which thing to reply or how. So I I posted a thing last night. I posted the same thing to the community and to um, tech support, um, and got a response a few hours later from somebody who said, yeah, we've got that problem and this other one. Um, and I checked on Twitter, and there's somebody with the other problem. Um, so it's it's a it's a weird. I I've thought the highest of Airtable, and they're still pretty. They're still way up there, but it's the kind of bug that you ship that you shouldn't ship. <laughs> Maybe they moved um, something in in the code. They they changed. You know, this um, the the other problem is. Um, uh, when you create tables or fields, um, they don't pick up right away. They, they don't exist. Uh, the system doesn't think they exist. So if you go to use them, um, they're not there until you refresh the page, which, of course, that's not something you do in a script. So, yeah, um, I, it's like, you know, at least thank goodness it's not data loss or something like that. But, yeah. You know, so shaking your confidence um, in the tool. But, a, a, a little bit except for Erin I was pleasantly surprised with Erin because mm -hmm. she, uh, she really went above and beyond to you know frontline uh, support tech shouldn't have come up with the workaround she did yeah. mm -hmm. cool so. yeah thank you 
anyone else with anything relevant or questions about that? I was actually looking for a poem. Wow, love that. Oh, there we go. I, I kind <laughs> of um, find all these things. I kind of lose them because I stopped being a poet. Mm. And that was uh, a sad sentence. No, I think calling oneself a former poet is much more poetic than actually self identifying as poet. <laughs> it, but it, it also means that you're not a poet, which is a, a loss in the world. Yeah. Um, well, it's. It is more but, poetic. I but can you ever be a can you ever be a former poet? I don't know. Allow me. Some time ago, I was riding a bus downtown and came across a large green field with tiny blue flowers. I'm surprised to be in this meadow between all these trees. Somewhere past leaves branching over my head, a thin river trickles by. I'll be walking through the dew, getting my fingers wet from the tops of the flowers when I get off the bus. That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just put a link in. Uh, boop. Boop. So for Rex, I was doing a poem with meetings, and here are the poems that I read. Oh. In here are the poems that I did read. So uh, "Democracy" by Dorian Lowe, uh, "Eden Then and Now," "Dutch Dusting," "Dreamwood." These are all poems, uh, each of which is connected to the poet, of course. So Forrest Hammer. And here's the call that I read that poem on. So I would make that link as well, which was kind of fun. <clears throat> and uh, here's a bunch of other poems by Forrest Hammer, who is a psychologist. And I'm totally forgetting about this. And I didn't, and, and so next to poems read in Rex is poems for Rex. And these were poems that I had not yet read in the group. And as I read them, I would sort of move them over. Um, oh, come on, little brain, you're not displaying them. There's a lot of poems here. Oh, okay. Well, I was well, kind of wondering about that. Wow, that's fascinating. I think I need to reboot my brain because there's a, there's a whole bunch of material that just didn't, didn't display. Uh, let's try that again. Come back. Make that call. Yes! Poems for Rex. Oh, so, this, so this is just A through C. You can see the wow. scroll bar down here. Um, so these, these are all... These are all uh, my filter for poems for Rex or Red and Rex was would this carry to start a meeting? Uh, is it sort of in the right size range, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I'll put links to, I just put a link to, to one of these thoughts in my brain. And these are like fun. These are, you know, and Poem A Day is fantastic. There's a couple of po poem apps. Poetry.com has a, a poetry app that's beautiful that kind of randomizes. They've tagged up all the poems by theme and content. So you can, if you want a sad poem about summer, you can kind of set the little whistle and it'll it'll show you a bunch of poems that that resonate for that uh, that theme and so forth is really cool. Um, one other thing is um, I was uh, writing in uh, hyper knowledge the other day and reading uh, one of my favorite rereading one of my favorite books called a poetics of mind by UC Berkeley professor um, basically arguing that um, we give too much credit to non-figurative thought that uh, basically, you know, language is primarily metaphor and um, the mind has a basic poetic structure. And so I have been um, intending to create a poetics um, aspect uh, or poetics channel within Mattermost um, and kind of, you know, wondering, you know, basically what are the poetics of mapping, the, the poetics of augmented intelligence, the poetics of intelligence, um, you know, my central research theme, um, here I'm reading Problems of Art, Susan K. Langer <laughs> this morning, um, is, uh, thank you, Jerry, that's the book exactly. Um, Gibbs, Gibbs is the, uh, the author. Yeah, Gibbs, um, and very interesting man, Gibbs. Um, Raymond Gibbs, if I remember correctly. Um, but basically, what are the aesthetics of knowing? And I was reading uh, from, uh, oh, um, Bateson's uh, second book of essays, um, A Sacred Unity, this morning as well, um, where he really is, is talking about you know the possibilities of 
um, when we are thinking about the conscious, uh, how adaptation is tied to conscious purpose, if there's kind of an aesthetic determinism that goes anywhere from the alpha um, member of a group being more beautiful, you know, uh, having better boots, you know, who knows, um, to, you know, just not exactly knowing what aesthetic rules are when it comes to the sense that someone has a green thumb, they have a better ability to deal with complex and living systems than other people. And they kind of grok the ability to see the whole rather than have the immoral short-sightedness that's almost intentional to say, no, I only want to look at this one thing. Everything else, no, we can't talk about that. Um, and, you know, kind of the ecological damage that, that comes from that. Um, anyway, the, the questions of aesthetics are very central in what I'm trying to figure out. And, uh, and it's not, not, you know, physics is much easier. <laughs> <laughs> or it feels much easier to me to basically have that kind of understanding that, um, as Bateson say, the pathology of um, uh, the way we currently do science is, you know, just more comfortable. We were just, I just grew up with it. We all did, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, there you go. Thanks, Mark. Um, Michael, you just stepped into the philosophical um, sort of end of our conversation. Um, and we were just through a bunch of different kind of OGME business, but uh, thinking about wrapping the call. And then we got into sort of, we kind of got back into a theme that came early in the call, which was um, how do we fold more art into our community and into our activities? So uh, whether that's being connected to local artists or other sorts of things. So, good to see you. So, yeah, how many uh, former poets are there in uh, OGM? We have a lot of good poets, actually. Um, a lot of, like Neil, uh, who's gotten busy in the meantime, but he was reading poems for us. Uh, Michael, you were just saying something, sorry. Oh, I was just saying, uh, I figured uh, dropping in late was better than not being here at all. So um, that was all I was going to say. Well, thank you, uh, and thanks for, for thanks being here. Thanks for the catch up. Cool. Um, good. I think I think that that was that's a lot of food for thought and a lot of things for for design. We got places to go, and uh, shall we wrap the call? Cool. Well, thank you all. More soon. Appreciate it. Thanks.